Richard, thanks so much for coming on the show. Pleasure. Well, I'm a big fan of the the the, the fact that you've kind of pioneered this 80-20 principle. It's something that I've apply and pretty much a lot of the decision makings that I do. I do it almost on a weekly basis and where I kind of write down some of my goals of what I wanted to accomplish. And then I do an 80-20 around what I think are the most impactful amongst those goals. And it's it's you know obviously something that millions of other people around the world have used as well. And I was even thinking about like, okay, what's the 80-20 of this interview? You know, what, what are some of the things that we can really try to distill down that will have the most amount of impact? And, um, you know, I, I guess we'll, we'll try to see if those are some of the questions that we go into. But we certainly want to go over the 80-20 before we have a discussion around your new book, which is called The Unreasonable Success and How to Achieve It. But to kind of give people an overview, obviously the 80-20 principle comes from the uh, Pareto principle or Pareto's law, I guess you could you could dis- distill it down to. But can you give us an overview of kind of where the origins of this comes from so that people get an understanding? Yes, there was once a very really shaggy bearded professor uh, <laughs> in Lausanne University And this guy was called Vilfredo Pareto, and he was an Italian, but he was living in Switzerland. Mm. And his um, uh, idea or his source of his uh, studies was actually looking at the wealth and the distribution of um, earnings in different European countries. So he looked at the distribution of wealth in England, for example, and then he looked in, uh, in Italy and Spain and France. And then he looked at the distribution of wealth over different time periods. He was working in 1896, uh, 97, when he wrote his book, which is entitled uh, Course in Political Economy. Mm. And w- what he did was to look at the proportion of people who had a certain degree of wealth or income. Uh, So he looked at the relationship between wealth and the number of people. And what he discovered was that there was an almost perfect fit in terms of a a straight line in in algebraic equation, or if you drew a graph um, on semi-log paper, which said that every time that you went up a certain proportion uh, to uh, a higher level of income or wealth, the number of people that actually fell into that category was much smaller and by a regular relationship between those. So he never actually used the phrase, Sean, 80-20. That didn't happen until the 1940s or 1950s. But it's essentially a shorthand which says that in any population, 20% of of people will account for 80% of the wealth. Uh, But it was also true because this relationship happened throughout the distribution that if you wanted to go up another 20%, then 4% of the population would account for 64%, 80% of 80% of mm. the wealth, and so on. And he was struck by the fact that this was such an extraordinarily good fit. You don't get that very often in economics or, or in anything, really. And so he, he believed that this was, this was really significant because it meant that the distribution of results and causes was very, very wonky it was asymmetrical it was it was unfair in a way that that you can actually have a situation where uh, a very small proportion of causes ended up with a very high proportion of results and so that's really what it is i mean i think peter drucker is from a management point of view was the first person really to focus in business on results and amazingly enough until drucker came along. Uh, people were interested in administration, etc., but they never actually looked very carefully at where the results came from. Well, this is, if you like, a second generation of that, because it says, okay, well, results is fine. We want to focus on results, but we also want to focus on what goes into the results. You know, what are the causes? And so uh, what I did when I wrote my book back in 1997 was to look at all of the things that have an asymmetrical relationship, which, as you said, the 80-20 of 80-20 were important. And there were really three things which which I I focused on more than anything else. One was 
that every sale, every, every dollar of revenue was not equivalent and every customer was not equivalent. And in fact, if you analyze the profitability of any particular product or any particular customer, you would find that there was this very odd relationship that 20% of customers or of products would account for the vast majority, 80%, maybe 90%, maybe 70%. These things are not precise, but they would account for uh, an awful lot of results. And so, you know, I said, well, this is, this is amazing because if you just focus on that, you then say, well, there are very few products and there are very few customers that actually are really important. Yeah. And most of the rest are not. Now, this is this is real heresy for a sales manager because everyone loves sales and you know, getting extra sales. But you have to look very carefully at what the incremental profitability of those sales is. And you also have to look at, at, uh, at customers and products and say, there's probably quite a long tail of products and of customers who are actually unprofitable. So, you know, Mr. Pareto's um, uh, maths didn't really take this into account. But, but in fact, wh- whenever I've looked at the distribution of profits at the versus sales, I find that there are really three groups of people. There, there are the very, very profitable products and customers, and there are the almost marginal, don't really matter products and customers. And then there's this, this other category, this third category, which are unbelievably useless. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not just useless, they're worse than useless because <laughs> They're, they're, they're hugely loss-making. And you can imagine that there are certain customers who are always very, very demanding of the time and attention of people. That goes into overhead. No one ever really thinks about that. And no one ever thinks very much about the psychic impact of that because horrible customers are horrible to deal with. Mm. And, and in fact, they, you know, they get a lot of attention, like the squeaky wheel on a trolley. You know, they get a lot of attention because they're not working properly. And then everyone tries very hard to deal with that. And it's completely hopeless because actually those people will never be satisfied. They'll never actually give the company what it, what it really wants or deserves. And so there are, there are those people who are in that category. And the best thing to do is to fire those people and fire your customers. Well, you know, 20 years ago, that seemed like heresy. Nowadays, I think people are actually getting a little more used to the idea that some customers might be useless. But actually, managers are very bad at trying to get rid, not just of customers, but of products, Mm -hmm. which are relatively unprofitable. So whenever I did, used to be a management consultant, I used to go into the companies and look at the profitability of, of products. And there were very few products which made an enormous, almost obscene uh, margin, sometimes 80% or 100% return on capital. And there were other products which were, you know, uh, not very interesting, maybe a 10% return on capital. And there are others, if you actually did a fully costed analysis, they were losing a huge, huge amount of money. So, you know, what I've always wanted people to do is focus on the things, the few things which actually produce fantastic results. And that's that's what you're doing when you're sitting down every week and looking at your, the things that you're doing. And what the, the, the second use, uh, the profitability, I said there are three uses in, in business. The second use, which I think is related to that, is time. You know, the time that you spend doing something is not the same, whatever it is relative to to what you're doing in terms of results. We all do some things which are incredibly valuable. So for example, we might invent a new product or we might come up with a new business formula. We might um, uh, win a customer who is gonna be fantastically profitable. We might come up with a creative campaign which um, gets people's attention. We might hire somebody who's much better than we are you know, what I mean? mm. and, and tremendously effective. Um, and there are those moments when, you know, you're in effect earning $1,000 an hour or $10,000 an hour. You know, if it's a new product which, which actually takes off, it could be something which lasts forever and ever for a very long period of time and is t- tremendously important. At the same time, we all do things which are very unimportant. They're, they're certainly, you know, moving bits of paper around is not, is not very productive. And, and yet people do it. Generally, meetings are not very productive, and yet people do because they're used to doing them. And we all waste enormous amounts of our time because we're not focused on the relationship between time and effort. And then I think the third thing which is important, uh, not just in business but in other areas, is the question of 
enjoyment and happiness and creativity. You know, there are some things which we love doing. Every one of us, every single person listening to this podcast absolutely adores doing some things. But I will tell you that that is not how you're spending most of your time in all probability. Because you're doing things which other people are getting you to do or other things which you are told that you have to do or have internalized that you're thinking that you must do this. And they are not necessarily terribly exciting to you. They're not necessarily things that make you happy. And so, you know, the, the things that make people happy in life are very, very few things. And, and, you know, there have been studies done on this which are pretty conclusive. So what do you need to do to be happy, for example? Well, the first thing to, to, to be happy is actually to love your work and do spend time on things which you really enjoy. The second thing is to have a partner who's really supportive and you, you are in an excellent relationship with that partner. The third thing you have to do is have a few friends, and it is a few friends because you know, if you actually think about the friends that are most important to you, generally you can count them on certainly two hands, maybe even one hand. Mm. And the other thing, the other things which are very important to people are community and family. And if you get those things right, you're going to be happy. And if you don't get those things right, you're not going to be particularly happy. But if I ask, I, the first question I always ask someone when I meet them and get to know them socially is, you know, do you enjoy your work? And it's amazing, you know. The number of people who actually say, yes, I enjoy all of my work is relatively few. Some people will say, I really enjoy parts of my work. I really enjoy it when I'm doing this. I really enjoy it when I'm doing a sales pitch. I really enjoy it when I'm creating a new product. And most of the time, though, they're not particularly happy. And other people say, well, actually, I earn a lot of money and it's all very good for my resume, but I don't really enjoy it. And, mm -hmm. you know, you talk to lawyers and they almost all say that because actually <laughs> it's very stressful. You have to work very hard. The, the scope for creativity is relatively limited and, and uh, they're horrible places to work. And also the worst thing is you have to work with other lawyers, which is terrible. But no, I'm, so, I'm sorry if you're a lawyer. But, but, you know, I advise you to go into a different line of business because there are other lines of business that, that actually are much more enjoyable than that and creative than that. So those are the three things which I think are important. And I've, I've been talking and talking and talking and not letting you ask any questions, Sean. So I'll no, I, I think it's important that we go through kind of the key highlights of how people can apply the 80-20 principle because I think what you've really done is you've extended the possibilities and the frameworks that people can use this this really powerful um, rule or principle uh, apart from you know what the originators like as you mentioned Vilfredo Prieto was intending it to be because I do think it's applicable and of course the 80 the exact numbers in 80 20 is not necessarily what's important here it's more about the the framework of how you think about it I, I did timestamp a few things that I thought would be important for um, kind of helping people apply the 80-20 principle in the best effective way possible. You mentioned managers. When you go in as, when you used to go in as a management consultant, you saw a lot of these managers not having even a realization that some of these projects or products were unprofitable. And this is something that's very common as it seems. Why do you think as humans in general, we're so bad at killing things that are just not beneficial for us that aren't valuable for us sean I, i've concluded there are two reasons above all there's usually three reasons <laughs> but this is definitely two, <laughs> where the two reasons are, 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 are dominant uh, one reason is that managers love complexity and i've been struck by this my whole career you know i go i go i used to go anywhere and talk to a lot of managers i do it now as an investor when i'm thinking of investing in a company and uh, when i'm talking to them about the business but managers actually like things to be quite intricate and complex particularly because most managers have got a, a scientific background or an engineering background or some, some hard scientific background. Increasingly, managers also are, are executives are from the humanities and, uh, you know, they might study some weird subject. They might be linguists. I'm mm -hmm. very interested in that. But, but, you know, still, it's a very hard engineering-based thing. And what does an engineer really want? An, an engineer wants a perfectly tuned product which will go and, and work for itself. But actually, if you look underneath the hood, 
imagine a car, for example, or anything. You know, it's pretty complicated. There are lots of pistons and things going up and down. And then, and then, of course, a manager will always like to say, well, of course, you know, that's generally true, but there are these exceptions and, you know, we we're actually fascinated by the exceptions because um, that's more interesting to us, and they will go and talk about that. They never actually stop and think and say, or rarely do they stop and think and say, uh, is all this complexity useful? So I, I think it's this love of complexity, and and it's intellectually challenging, but it's not necessarily something which you know customers want or something which is very difficult to do. Um, and I think the second reason why people actually don't use this idea very much or you know, are not used to the comparing results and causes is because they want to be busy. You, you know uh, uh, that one of the great ideas, one of the great book, book titles anyway, uh, is Tim Ferriss's The Four Hour Work Week. Well, this is such an extraordinary thing. It sort of grabs your attention. And I think... You know, I mean, when I first saw it, heard it, I thought, well, this is, this is, a, this is a taking my idea a bit too far. <laughs> uh, but when I actually stopped to think about it, I said, well, actually, maybe there are, are only four, four hours of each week when I'm really doing something which is fantastically useful. So what do you do with the other, you know, 36 hours if you work a 40 hour week? Or oh, God forbid, People work 50, a lot of very ambitious people work 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. I've done it, and I very much regret having done it. But, you know, how do you fill your time? Well, you know, busyness is something that we are all attuned to. The idea that if you're important, you've got to be busy is so strongly rooted into our culture that it's very, very difficult to escape it. And, you know, I used to work in a, 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 an open plan office when we started OK as a consulting firm. And we had, you know, lots of young people sitting outside and everyone was dashing around and all the rest of it. But the, the, the thing that people really wanted was the time of the top people. So everyone measured their importance in the company, unconsciously or consciously, by how much time and how much attention they were g- given by the top people. People were, were initially there were three of us in this office who were partners, and it was a huge office, and there were about a hundred people outside. So you can imagine that actually it was very difficult not to be busy because you were, in a sense, because we started the company, important. So people, everyone wanted a slice of your time, and you know, human nature is such we're all deeply, and and this is a very good thing in most cases, but not for profitability. We're all deeply egalitarian, at least, you know, uh, in the West. That's one of the great strengths of the culture is that, that we got away from this idea that, that, you know, there are very few important people and, uh, and everyone is worthy of attention and everyone's worthy of respect. And I absolutely believe that. But the, the bad thing for that is that the top people actually get incredibly busy because everyone wants their time. And what should the top people be doing? You know, well, my mentor, Bill Bain, always used to say, don't let action drive out thought. And the most valuable thing that you can do and I can do and anyone who's reasonably successful or aspires to be successful can do is actually to think. Now, you sit there in an office and, you know, there's no one sitting next to you. You're not tutoring someone. You're not mentoring someone. You're not explaining something. You're not getting something done. You're not on the phone to a customer. You're, you know, you're doing nothing. You're sitting there. You're thinking, you know, and you might be sitting in a, and reading a book. You know, well, it's hopeless. You know, you're not expected to do that. And so you fill your time with tasks which are inherently less, and I, I'm guilty of this as much as anybody else, but are much less important than the things that you could be doing if you're actually thinking. Now, what Bill Bain did was he worked this out, and although he had a fantastically beautiful office full of baseball uh, and basketball memorabilia, you know, what he did was never to come to the office. Well, of course, he came to the office on occasions, but he had this huge office. Everyone else was crunched up in sort of, you know, little cubicles and, and sort of dashing around, so it was very unfair from that point of view. But it was even worse because he never came to the office, or he came to the office very rarely. In fact, you know, I always used to joke, and it didn't get me uh, much uh, uh, favour from Bill. <laughs> I used to say, well, of course, 
Bill's not like letting action drive out thought because he spends more time on the tennis court than he does in the office. And there were all kinds of false constraints built into his diary. You know, his personal system would, you know, you went along and said, I'd like to talk to Bill for 15 minutes. She said, suck her teeth and sort of schedule. And said, if you look very carefully, you could see that there were blank pages in there. So they're all false constraints. But he had the right idea. You know, it might sound very selfish or it might sound very unreasonable. But, but because he had lots of time to think, he came up with a business formula for a consulting firm, which has never been um, uh, equaled or exceeded. And uh, we won't go into that unless you're particularly interested. But, but, but nevertheless, there is this thing that, that conspires, really, to the more successful you are, the busier you are, mm. and the less likely, therefore, that you're, 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 in effect, trading on the past. You're living on your, resting on your laurels. You're trading on the seed corn that you've already got. If you really want to be successful for, you know, the longer term, you've always got to have a new challenge. And that means that you've got to think of something new and different to do, which is in accordance with the few principles, like the 80-20 principle, which determine whether or not you're likely to be on the right track. You need to think of something which uses relatively little money or relatively few people and can achieve a great result. And the only way that you can do that is to think of something that nobody else has thought of. And, you know, you can't do that if you're busy and you're, and you're in an office, particularly in an open plan office like a goldfish uh, uh, bowl where everyone can see what's going on. You know, I go, when I want to actually do something really good, I go and sit on the fish pond, which is, you know, my house is uh, some distance from here. I'm not, talk not talking to you from it because the internet connection is very poor in the, in the uh, countryside. And I've now come to a friend's house where the internet's very good because it's in a city. But, you know, I sit on the fish pond and I think, and I don't, I don't take a computer or a phone or anything like that. I take a notebook, you know, a little notebook with me, and I take a pen. <laughs> and I sit there and I define what issue I'm going to be thinking about. And then I might read a book as well. Uh, I might look at my car, the sort of, you know, very calming effect that they have um, of, of looking at the fish or trying to spot a snake that might be sneaking into the fish pond. It's... <laughs> In a sense, I'm goofing off, but I'm not, actually. I mean, all of my good ideas come from spending time there when I, I don't have to worry about the schedule and I don't have to worry about getting in touch with someone. And actually, I, I don't even know what I'm doing in many occasions. I, you know, I, don't, I don't know which problem I'm going to be addressing, but, I, but that's when the breakthroughs come. And I know that that's true for a lot of other people as well uh, because – for one thing, I always encourage them to do that, and they always come back to me and say, yes, you're right, Richard, that, that actually the only way that I can actually get something truly original done is to forget about everything else and all the pressures which successful people have. And um, so I think I've answered the question, yes, that, that people love complexity and also people love being busy because that's taken as the currency of success, mm. whereas actually in order to be really, really successful, and this may lead into the other book, but but you need to do things which are unorthodox and you need to do things which are original because otherwise if you're just copying what someone else is doing. You know, there are lots of people doing it and by definition, the returns are not going to be very good. Yeah, and just to add on to that, just, just to emphasize the importance of that, you know, I've, I've even heard of, you know, some of the top CEOs, I think the CEO of LinkedIn, Jeff Weiner, he purposely schedules what he calls blank times on his calendar, where I think the traditional way to use a calendar is to fill in times where you're yeah. busy and you have meetings and you have the, and he really just kind of flipped that script around. And, you know, you kind of have to schedule these things because as you mentioned, these are really where the best ideas come from. And, you know, I'm curious, you mentioned your notebook as you're, you're, you're sitting on your pond and you're writing some of these things down. I think some of the things that people may struggle with is, okay, so we have this 80-20 principle where, you know, 20% of the inputs can drive the 80% of the outputs. And I think for a lot of people, what they're thinking is it's easier said than done, meaning people have a hindsight bias, of course, of when the results come in that these inputs may have resulted in what the uh, success was. But when you're sitting down and you're thinking, 
what is a good framework or you know kind of process that maybe works for you may, may not work for everyone but maybe just personally for you that allows you to really choose those inputs effectively that could potentially drive those 80 percent returns or 80 returns what i learned in bain and company was that at the start of each project we undertook something which was called a red book and i i guess the origin was that the the piece of paper was not green it was red and there was nothing magical about it being red uh, but you would have three pages for the, the book okay so one page the first page would be to say write down the critical issues that you're trying to address and this is not just for a consulting project this is for anything that you want to do so you know what are the important things to find out if you want to do something new that's going to be very very successful and there can't be more than seven of them and there can't be fewer than three of them which sort of the, the general rule so you write down what are the critical issues here what don't i understand that's really what you're trying to say because the exciting thing about business or the exciting thing about art or any any project that's worth doing is actually what you don't know. It isn't what you do know. So you want to write down these critical ideas, okay? The, the critical issues, if I knew the answer to these three, four, five, six, seven things, that would tell me what to do. And I don't know the answer because no one's got data on this. No one's even thought about these issues, really. So one page is these critical issues. The second page is to say, what are your hypotheses on the critical issues? So that you go back to the seven things and you say, what do I think may be the answer? Now, the first time you do this, you're almost certainly going to be wrong because it would be a jolly simple project or a simple set of things that you're thinking about if, if you actually came up with the answer just by thinking about it the first time, okay? So, but you write down, what do you think the answer is? What's, you know, what's your best guess at this? And I'm always amazed that because you are, because you've got to fill out the second page of the thing and you're using a pen and paper, not a screen or anything like that, you actually force yourself to, to think creatively about it. And sometimes when I do this collaboratively with people, I take them on a walk. So it only works really with two or three people because you have to walk alongside each other. Uh, and you want to walk some, somewhere which is, you know, beautiful, etc. And often you're going through the countryside. You're not going on a road. You're going on a, a path, a lane. So, you know, it's not very wide. But anyway, you actually say to someone, well, you know, what's, what for, what's the first critical issue that we're trying to address? And that, that themselves, you know, may take quite a bit of thought. And then you say, well, you know, what's your hypothesis? What's your best guess about that? And they say, well, I've never really thought about it, Richard. Um, so I said, fine, you've got plenty of time. Let's walk a bit. And then, you know, you come up with your best guess on that. And I'll come up with my best guess. And we'll see whether they're similar. They might even be, it's not just a question of coming up with a number. It's actually coming up with a, a thought about what's important. So you might say, for example, if we wanted to have the most successful company in a particular area, how would we do things differently from someone else? That might be a critical issue. Uh, and then, well, there are hundreds of potential, thousands, millions probably, potential answers to that because it's a very open-ended question. Sometimes the questions you ask are, are pretty close-ended, but, but often they're pretty open-ended. And then you, you actually say, well, you know, what do you, what do, what do you think, uh, William, you know, is the answer? What do you think, Martha, is, is the answer? The, the hypothesis you've got to come up with a hypothesis you've got to fill it in so then you actually uh, you do that <clears throat> and then you go through all of those when you come back to this and I'll, I'll mention the third stage in a moment but when you come back to this a week later or a month later or three months later you will find that your hypotheses will evolve that, that what you actually thought was important to start with is generally not what you end up with, or it's a refinement, but a very important refinement of the original idea that you have. So, Sean, you, 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 you actually write down the, your hypotheses and you compare that to other people's hypotheses. You might ask people to do this as an exercise and then get together uh, and, and read out your answers, or you might do it interactively, such as on a walk. But 
The third thing which you need to do is say, well, what data or information, because it doesn't necessarily have to be numerical data, it can be information very broadly defined, do I need to collect in order to decide whether this hypothesis is correct or not? And in fact, also to, to decide whether it's very relevant in answering the, the thing which you're trying to answer in the first place, which is the critical issue. And this methodology is so simple, but it's so effective because you go away and you can collect some data and then the, the data indicate, you know, either your hypothesis is right or it was wrong or it was irrelevant or it was of marginal relevance or that the real question that you should have been asking was such and such rather than what you actually started with. So you might say, you know, if you were doing a, a you know, a pretty closed end example of this, you might say, you know, what are the most profitable products that we make? And then the, the point is, it's actually sometimes quite difficult to specify how you would group together the population of products. Of course, you could do it by individual products. But say, for example, you were making a thousand products, then what you really want to answer is what are the groups of those thousand products that are most profitable. And you might say, well, that it's, they obviously fall into the category of the most expensive products versus the cheapest products in the product range. But that might not be correct. Um, for example, one of, one of the things that I was fascinated with when I was um, uh, working in consulting firms, strategy consulting firms, and later even more so when I was one of the owners of this uh, firm was what are the projects which are most profitable and you know we didn't really know the answer to that question now, now there were some answers which came out fairly quickly uh, such as m a work if you were working on mergers and acquisitions it's almost certainly true that the um the client is going to be pretty price insensitive because they actually really desperately want to make an acquisition or they some, in some cases want to desperately avoid being required. But, but nevertheless, you'd say, well, that's very important because those things are not price sensitive. And uh, in fact, in many cases, they don't even go through the profit and loss statement. So, you know, you can write off, you know, uh, consulting fees for an acquisition as part of the acquisition costs. Well, that doesn't go through any profit and loss statement. So no one's too worried about that. But equally, what we, what, what we discovered when we thought about it was that there was a really strong correlation between the length of the project and its profitability, which was not immediately obvious at all. So it was generally true that short projects were much less profitable than long projects. And the reason for that, you can understand probably, is that, is that on short projects, it takes a lot of time to gather the information and to really understand the issues. And then you have to deliver your answer relatively quickly. Whereas on long projects, you can really go into one level of depth, second level of depth, third, third level of depth. And it takes a long time before um, an organization can actually internalize what's important. And so therefore, long projects, you, you, you have a much closer relationship between the consulting firm and the client. And that means that you're not just producing short-term answers, but you're producing long-term answers because people are really thinking about the issues. And then if they really understand what's, what's going to make them highly profitable, they, they, they can't help but think about that in their unconscious mind, even when they're asleep or whatever. They can't help but think about what's important. And, and therefore, it's going to have not just, it's not going to solve, just solve the immediate problem. It's actually going to attune them to, to what they might do in the future that's going to be very profitable or what they should avoid doing because it's very unprofitable. So we, we did discover this. And, and in fact, it was quite ironic in a way that, that Bill Bain had come up with this formula, which was so different from other consulting firms, which said, you know, we'd only work for the top person in the organization. If you analyze the profitability of any consulting firm of any type against um, the sponsor internally within the organization you know is it the head of personnel human resources you know is it the manufacturing function is it the head of uh, this particular region or this particular country is it the head of international um is it uh someone who is in the accounting department is it a relatively junior manager 
who's in charge of logistics or, or whatever. You will find that the projects which are the most profitable are those which are for the chief executive, for the head person. Because if you're working for him or her, you have a lot of power. You know, he's very interested or she's very interested in what the result is. And therefore, it affects their career as well. And they're not terribly price sensitive on anything that affects their career. We're all human beings. We're all motivated to do what is in our own interests. So if you're working with someone who's very powerful, you can actually make change in an organization so much faster and so much fuller and so much more intelligently than if you're not. But until Bill Bain enunciated this idea, the firm which was a dominant firm in boardroom consulting was McKinsey, and it still is actually. But McKinsey uh, actually never, ever made it a condition, even though they had all the prestige and all the reputation, and most importantly, the alumni, the people who'd worked in McKinsey and not been successful in McKinsey. So they got into jobs where they could hire the McKinsey people because the McKinsey people were smarter and they knew that they were smarter <laughs> than they were themselves. They might be better at actually doing things, of course, because consultants notoriously can't do anything. But nevertheless, you know, in terms of thinking, they would want McKinsey. But McKinsey never made it a condition that the chief executive of the whole shooting match would would work uh, with them and that they would be the sponsor of the project. Well, Bill Bain said, I'm not, we're not going to work for anybody except the chief executive officer. So, you know, the answer, if you were actually doing a, a, a red book exercise for a consulting firm, is exactly what Bill Bain came up with, which was only work for the top person, only work on very long projects, because his idea was that, that there'd be a continuous relationship between the consulting firm and, and the project. So you didn't need new clients in order to be successful because you could grow the business within the existing client. And then, of course, you encourage the client to take over other companies. You start the whole process again. And so endlessly, you know, the thing could carry on for decades. I mean, it didn't usually carry on for more than about 10 or 12 years because the chief executive usually changed. But, but nevertheless, it was it was a, a great idea. And then, you know, you could say, well, I'll be working on the really important issues. It, you know, it, it was all 80-20 analysis, although they didn't think of it necessarily in those terms. You know, what, what are the things which are going to move the lever? You know, what are the things that are going to actually uh, move the dial? You know, what are the things which are going to make this company so much more successful than another company? And it all comes from trying to f find out, categorizing the things that you need to do, the patterns in a business which are important in order for profitability. Um, and accounting systems don't tell you that. You know, accounting systems will tell you the gross product, uh, profit of the product. They'll tell you, they might even if they're really sophisticated systems, tell you divide up the overhead between products, although most companies just don't do that because it's quite difficult, you know. But but the answer might be completely orthogonal, completely laterally unrelated to that issue. It might be a question of, you know, is it a new product or is it a new project or is it something that the top person is really interested in? And these are the questions, these are the answers which will only emerge if you think about things, not just in a quantitative way, but in a qualitative way, you're trying to recognize patterns of profitability, patterns of importance. And every single new company, which has been wildly successful, and again, we might go on to talk about the unreasonable successful here, has had a chief executive who looked at the world differently. So Steve Jobs would be a great example of that because before that, before Jobs, no one ever thought the key thing was the artistic nature of the product. No one ever thought that you wanted to make insanely great products. And why would you try that? Because it was insanely difficult. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was, it was insanely challenging and, and rewarding and exciting. And, you know, if you could come up with the original Macintosh or if you could come up with the iPhone or the iPad or, or, um, uh, any of those devices, you know, you, you could actually be, 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 you know, you could write your own check in terms of, you know, in terms of profitability. When you go into uh, an industry and you actually get a third of the revenue that every, um, recording company, every, every, uh, uh, body who's using your platform actually gives you because you, the iPhone is providing a platform for it. You know, no one had ever thought about doing that before. Building a platform and actually getting people to come onto the platform and charging them a third of their revenues. Sure. 
Uh, yeah. You know, uh, so it's it's those ideas which are they're certainly related to the 80 20 principle, but they're not obvious. And the only way that you can actually come up with them is by thinking from first principles and saying, you know, if, if I was redesigning this industry from scratch or this company from scratch, what would make it unbelievably profitable? Mm. And the methodology for dealing with that, you can you can do critical issues, hypotheses on the critical issues, and the information that you need to to, to deal with that. And I think it doesn't even have to be written down. If you're actually thinking about those things, that, that they're very important, you'll come up with the answers to those. But they've got to be answers that nobody else has got, had before, because otherwise you won't do something which is very original and unbelievably successful. Yeah. Yeah, and, and in addition to some of the things that you've you've pointed out, it, it seems like you know, a great example is the iPhone and Steve Jobs' decisions to have an open platform and allow other app developers to come in. It's that, you know, in the age of leverage where we're having software and code automations, really the, the this also includes employees, of course, but it's probably, you know, for tech entrepreneurs, this is really gonna be on an exponential level that these small decisions that we make are becoming increasingly more important because of the leverage that it has in terms of you know the the the, the impact that it has, and it, it seems like because of that, it's it's becoming increasingly more important. And this is kind of like a segue into talking a little bit about investing. Is that it seems like in this existing landscape, in terms of you know business at least, particularly in tech, we've kind of been entering this winner takes most market. Sometimes winner takes you know pretty much everything. And and it seems like that really accentuates the importance of decisions in terms of what business to be in and the types of decisions that you need to be able to make as an as an executive or as an entrepreneur. Um, do do you feel that the and feel free to go into the the star principle a little bit. Um, but but do you feel that because of this landscape that we're in that it's no longer the eighty twenty principle in many cases where it's not going to be the twenty percent of companies that I. 80%, but it's going to be the one to 2% that drives, you know, 98 to 90%. And if that's true, you know, as an operator, as an entrepreneur coming into, a, a, you know, this new market, what are, you know, knowing that second and third place means could potentially be a fraction of the market instead of a sizable market like before, you know, what would your advice be for an entrepreneur coming into this winner takes most kind of market? Yes, I mean, I think that nowadays a lot of people focus on, on networking and network uh, characteristics, and I think that's very important. The idea that if you, you really want a situation where the more customers you've got, the more profitable things are automatically because the more valuable they are for them. So we always look in my, in my uh, investment uh, ideas at the, at the question of whether the network effects, but network effect is really a subset of something even easier to describe and um, even more powerful, I think, which is the Boston Consulting Group's growth share matrix, where you remember you have your dogs, you have your cows, you have your question marks, and you have your stars. And what BCG discovered was that the vast majority of um, cash flow over the life of a, a company or the life of a product came from businesses which were star businesses. So it could be within a company that they had very few um, star businesses, maybe just one that was vitally important for the company. You think about Google search as being you know, a prime example of that. But, but also you needed to operate in a market which was growing fast. And you know most markets don't grow fast because you know GDP growth is three percent a year in normal circumstances and, and so you know you really want to be in those few markets or countries or applications or products which are growing at hundred percent a year and can grow hundred percent a year for a long period of time or thirty percent a year or even three hundred percent a year so the, the the question to be asked as an investor is always am I investing in a star business and again BCG definition was they said at least 10% market growth, although I think we ought to be more ambitious than that these days. Um, but can I be the leader in that particular area? And of course, 
you can, there's only one leader in a market unless there are two people exactly the same size, which is really unstable, doesn't last for very long. Uh, so can I be the, the leading firm in a particular area? And very often that means you have to invent it because it's very difficult to replace a leader who's already the incumbent, already firmly entrenched in that particular area because they've got the customers, they've got the reputation, they've got the marketing spend, and very importantly, they've got the profitability because they're larger that the smaller companies don't have. So you can, if you've got massive capital resources or if you're incredibly clever, uh, actually take market leadership away from someone. Or sometimes it's the leader just makes a horrible mistake. Like, for example, you know, Coca-Cola could disappear. It you know, grew at 10% a year uh, for 70 years. And then someone thought that you should change the formula of Coca-Cola, which is a <laughs> disastrous mistake. But they realized that just in time. But but, you know, unless a leader makes a real gaffe, that, you know, then it's very difficult to overtake. So what do you need to do? You need to come up with a, some, a different segment. You need to say, I'm not going to focus on this type of customer. I'm going to focus on that type of customer. So, you know, one of, one of my most successful investments was Betfair, where I didn't come up with the idea, but a very clever guy called Andrew Black came up with the idea of a betting exchange, which was an electronic market like the stock market. Historically, betting had always been done set by bookmakers who originally had a, a book, you know, and they just basically added up all of the um, different bets that they were allowing people to place. And they made sure that there was at least a 10%, what they call over round in the betting industry, which means that if you backed every horse in a race or if you backed every possibility in a football match, you would, you didn't care which horse won because the book would be matched and you'd make a 10% or 20% profit on that. So the odds were set by a bookmaker from the top to the bottom. And Bert's idea was to have a, uh, Andrew Black's idea, uh, he was known as Bert to his friends, his idea was actually to set an electronic market where you and I could set the odds, it was done electronically, and you could actually say, you could oppose um, a particular horse or football team or whatever it was, and uh, the people would take the bet on the other side if they thought the odds were attractive enough. And this worked amazingly well. Well, you were going after a completely different type of customer there. You were going after people who were not what they call recreational, or generally not recreational bettors, people who, like me who do it for fun. But they were professionals. You know, they were people who wanted to make a living out of it. Uh, you were going for people who placed large bets rather than small bets. And you were going for people who actually wanted to trade the bets as well, because even before a match or a horse race started, you could make a profit by guessing which way the momentum was going in the, in the market and taking that particular bet and opposing other ones where they were drifting out and, uh, towards longer odds. So it was a completely different way of thinking about betting. And when I uh, came across this company, it was because after nine months of operation, I didn't uh, invest in the first round, but a friend of mine did. And after nine months of operation, they'd run out of money. And the reason they'd run out of money was that they had to start with very little capital because none of the professional venture capitalists would support this company. And the reason that they didn't do that made perfect sense, which is they said they came along and People talked about this idea and they said, yes, you know, the idea is quite good. Um, but who's running it? And they said, well, actually, um, there's this guy called Bert Black, who's one of the founders. And there's, other, there's this other guy. And neither of them actually had ever run a company before. No, neither of them actually had ever um, started a company before. None of them had ever none of the management had ever um, really worked in a normal firm. They were all people who were sports or betting enthusiasts. So you had it, it's like there's some lunatics taking over the asylum. And so no professional venture capitalist would put money into this company. But I was persuaded by the fact that it was a star business. It was tiny, 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 tiny when I, was, when I came across it. But it was growing fantastically fast. And why was it growing fantastically fast? It was growing fast because it was a star business, very, very small business. But nobody did business the way that Betfair did. It invented a new business model right. for an industry which was thousands of years old. 
you know, people have been gambling, you know, since almost since the Garden of Eden. So, you know, I thought it was a, a fantastic idea. And also it evaded competition with the big guys because the big guys would have to build a betting exchange and they'd have to understand the mentality behind it. And not only that, it would cannibalize the very profitable business which those people had when they were making 10 or 20 percent on a particular event and what you know, was that for taking uh two percent and only on winning bets wow. so initially it started at five percent but if you got to a reasonable they had a sliding scale so you know it got to two percent and if you assumed you won and you lost half the time which is pretty much the case for most people who gamble uh the real the real uh, cost was one percent as opposed to probably 15% for the competition, which meant that if you had a certain amount of money that you wanted to spend on gambling, it could last 15 times as long, or perhaps even more than that because of the multiplicative effect of it. Uh, you didn't run out of your money so quickly, uh, which is what happens with most gamblers. Uh, and so uh, it, was, it was a fantastic idea. The only question in my mind was whether it could remain the leader in the new segment which it, it had invented. I've forgotten what your original question was, Sean. So I've answered it. Yeah, no, we can, we can we can keep going into this. I I, I was really just asking, um, you know, how do you identify the star principal businesses, and in terms of Betfair, I guess what was, you know, it seems like they were looking for volume because two percent is certainly you know on winning bets is a fraction of you know what these regular uh, traditional uh, gambling oh, companies were, were making. Yeah. So, you know, for, for, for you in terms of trying to make this bet, like what, what did you see in Betfair? Did they have some sort of a network effect in this business that you thought could keep them at bay? I mean, it was partly that. I mean, certainly there was a network effect because if you, if you were on Betfair, you wanted more people to come on Betfair because the problem with Betfair in the first um, few months was that only about half the bets which people wanted to make were consummated because there wasn't someone on the other side of the transaction who would do it and so that the you know the there wasn't you know necessarily the ability to place your bet and of course that's very frustrating for them. so what the people in the early days did was they encouraged their friends particularly people who were like them who were professional gamblers or who were heavy gamblers or who were just very clever gamblers and price sensitive gamblers and also people who might have a little bit of inside information quite frankly that they were trying to trade on they encouraged those to go so there was this network effect where where the more people you had in the system the more useful it was for the people in the system and therefore people had an incentive to do that but the other thing which was uh, yeah they're taking one percent or two percent rather than fifteen percent but but the costs were a fraction because you didn't need any marketing because the network effects generated the market. In the in the first few years, that they spent nothing at all on marketing, um, and they didn't even have a marketing director. The woman who was in charge of marketing, so, so called, was a, a lady who understood publicity and PR, and, and certainly bet that generated a lot of that because it was very interesting as a new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But but the costs were hugely less. You know, the cost of, of actually transacting once you'd established your um, your site and once you've established the system behind it, um, you know, were, were trivial compared to bookmakers who traditionally, or it was changing with the internet, but traditionally had had betting shops, so off-track bookmakers. You have a shop and you go in the high street. Well, obviously you have to pay rent. You have to have a manager for each one of these, these, sh these shops. You know, you then have to aggregate all the things and you have to have control systems, which are very expensive. You didn't have to have that for Betfair because it was all done on one particular system. And if you design the system, I mean, it's again, software eating the world, isn't it? You know, you basically then had um, a system which was very robust and also provided an audit trail. So for the first time, it was possible for investigators to be sure who had placed which bet and to, if there were any suspicious bets, they could actually investigate those. Whereas absolutely hopeless on a racetrack where people just come along and they disappear after a few hours and very, very difficult also with traditional bookmakers and the systems that they had. So it was, it was a vastly superior system and it was vastly lower cost. So, of course, you didn't see that in the early days because they were just getting going and they needed capital and they 
didn't have capital, but once they got going, they generated, as all gambling businesses do, a, a huge amount of, of profit, um, even for someone who wasn't setting the odds and was taking a very low commission. Nevertheless, they were facilitating it, and the volume started to grow enormously, and the profitability of the company started to grow enormously from that point of view. So, yes, it was network effects, but it was also the fact that the business formula was different and it enabled much lower operating costs. Right. And so, you know, that's, that is the, the other secret to, to uh, success. I once wrote a book called Simplify. And what Simplify said was that there were two different ways of simplifying the market. One was to go for the very highest scale and very low cost. So you think about, you know, uh, a full line airline you know, with lots of frills and, and lounges for people and giving meals and all that sort of stuff versus a budget airline that would cut costs to the bone by, for example, not having, uh, allowing the passengers to put their bags through to a different destination. So you just have point to point, you know, right. you know Southwest Airlines would operate in three Texan uh, cities and that, that nothing in between. So you lower the cost enormously and you increase the volume. It's what, what McDonald's did with the, the coffee shop, that they limited the menu to nine items from the hundreds of coffee shop had, got rid of all the waitresses because you didn't need to, uh, to provide that. You know, a totally different business model, which lowers costs. And the other way to do it is the way that Steve Jobs did, was providing something which was so attractive as a product that people really didn't mind what they paid for. So it was a, you know, what I call proposition simplifying. So if you want to, you know, those are the two opposite extremes of the thing. But but the key is to do come up with a business formula, whether they're charging high prices or low prices, which can be greatly more profitable than the traditional way of doing things because it's doing it differently and it's start starting with a clean sheet of paper. Yeah, definitely. Um, I also want to make sure we have time to get through your new book in reasonable success and how to achieve it. And I'm sure a lot of the characteristics, there you go. I'm sure a lot of the characteristics that we've talked about in terms of, you know, the entrepreneurs running, you know, the star principal businesses, um, you know, I, I understand not all of the people that you've mentioned are in business, but maybe we can go over in terms of what are the stories and the people that you've decided to choose and, um, you know, I, I did select some of the key principles that I wanted to go over, like having high expectations and making your own trail. But maybe we can start with an overview in terms of the people that you've decided to to display. Yes, thank you. I need to go after about 10 minutes. So we're, so let's have 10 minutes on this, if, if we Definitely. may. But thank you very much, because obviously I want to plug my latest book. Of course, it's yeah. also something I'm very passionate about. I started off by trying to try and think what why is it that some people are more successful than others? And then I particularly wanted to answer the question, which was, why is it that some people who don't appear to be particularly talented or that, that brilliant actually achieve remarkable results which do change the world? Or people that might have character flaws, like, you know, Steve Jobs had lots of character flaws, you know. How could it be that these people who do the opposite of what you're traditionally supposed to do by being a good manager, you praise everyone, you give you, you know, you just, just basically um, uh, support them and you nurture them. And, you know, Steve Jobs bullied people, and, and he, and, but he particularly bullied not the weak, which is what most bullies do, but he, be, he bullied strong people. Well, you know, how is it that these people could be very, very successful? So I took 20 people that I either knew about or in some cases actually knew personally who had been very, very successful in their own particular sphere. And uh, they weren't necessarily in business, as you said, there was Jobs there, was Jeff Bezos was there. But I also took um, people in the arts, Leonardo da Vinci was there. Um, I don't know if you think of her as an artiste, but uh, Madonna was there, Bob Dylan, certainly as a poet, he was there. You know, I took people who in their own sphere had undoubtedly changed the world in one way or another. <laughs> and um, I, I took the economist John Maynard Keynes because he solved the problem of mass unemployment, you know, just through one idea. Uh, and, and I also looked at some politicians who'd been very successful. Otto von Bismarck, the most successful European statesman in the whole of the 19th century who unified 
Germany and then said we're going to stop because you know Germany's been unified, Italy's been unified, and um, we'll therefore have peace for the next generation. And while Bismarck was in power for 27 years, that's what he actually did. Very very successful people like someone like Margaret Thatcher, who you know wasn't a very um, to be very rude about it. She she wasn't the brightest. Um, politician in Parliament by a long way, but she was very, very successful because because of circumstances which I can describe later on. Um, why is it that some people manage to change the world and other people don't? And I call it unreasonable success because, firstly, it was unreasonable for any one person to have a huge impact on the world because there are seven billion people. Why should there? You know, again, you might say it's an extension of the 80 20 principle, but why should it be true that anyone can really change the world except in a very, very small corner of it? Mm. Um, but they do. Uh, it was unreasonable in the sense that very often this came from, not from reason, but from intuition, that the people who I studied were almost all very, very intuitive. And it was unreasonable in the sense that. In many cases, they didn't deserve it. It seemed that they'd just been very, very lucky. But of course, luck is just what we can't explain. And so I was trying to explain why these people were lucky uh, to a, a quite unreasonable degree. Yeah. So I talked to 20 people uh, who had been very successful, and I looked at possible reasons. I'd had a long list of about 50 reasons why they might be successful. So one reason that they might be successful, I started off with, was taking high risks. But actually, although 11 of the people in my 20 had actually taken high risks, nine of them hadn't. And so, you know, they included my one of my former mentors, Bruce Henderson, who founded the Boston Consulting Group, and a whole new way of looking at business through strategy consulting. Uh, he didn't take a single risk in his life, I don't think, apart from risking being fired because he was a very cantankerous sort of character. But uh, he certainly never took any financial risks. So why was it that they were successful? So I started off with my long list, and I came down to nine items, which uh, all of them, all 20 people, had to demonstrate these characteristics and I don't know if I can remember them all, uh, at well, but the, one of them. Yeah, uh, so the, the one that really stood out for me was yeah. the the ability to make your own trail, and I think it intertwines kind of this contrarian thinking that a lot of entrepreneurs, that are people in the Star Principle category, and also investors like yourself, have a commonality in, and and um, that one was really what stood out for me. Would would love to go into kind of what you think that. You know, how people, how those people even develop those things that could help the listeners perhaps develop more contrarian thinking. Yes, making your own trail is essential. The, the way that those people made their own trail in many cases was by following a trail that someone else had, had uh, gone before and then suddenly veering off in a different direction. So the trail would carry on, but they would find a different way of, of using that particular idea. <clears throat> In business, for example, you know, one of the great ideas which has always been successful is self-service. So, you know, people would take a different view about where self-service could be applied. It might also be something where <clears throat> retailing, for example, was an, you know, an idea which is, you know, well, also thousands of years old. <clears throat> and yet, you know, Jeff Bezos was the first person to actually apply the idea that everything could be sold through the Internet. And this is back in 1992, 1993, when most people thought the internet was great for creativity and great for new ideas and great for social reasons, but certainly not for building a huge retailing empire. So, you know, it was, a, 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 you know, you can also say that Bert Black, with his betting exchange, was following a model which had been very successful, which was an electronic exchange, like the stock market became electronic in the 1980s, and he was just applying that to betting. So one of the clues is definitely to follow a trail which goes so far and is clearly a very successful, I call them business genes, an idea which just works in business very well. Software at its broadest is something like that. You know, something which undoubtedly is low cost, and if you actually have a very successful software business, it can be very high margin because you can just basically apply it with almost no 
staff uh, because the system itself works. Well, take an idea like that and apply it in a sphere which is different from other people. But another of the um, uh, nine ideas, which I think is very important, is a transforming experience. Because one of the very thrilling discoveries I made as I was reading biographies of these people and thinking about my experiences of them as well, was that there was a time in their life, which could be a year or it could be, it was as short as four hours for one of the people in the book, or it could be as long as five years. One of the experiences was Victor um, Frankel was one of the people who was the third wave, of, invented the third wave after Freud and Adler of thinking about psychotherapy and what's important. And he came up with the, the idea that what we're all looking for in life is meaning. Uh, well, he would never have had that opportunity if he'd not been put into a concentration camp by Adolf Hitler. And for five years, he actually recreated the book which he was uh, thinking of writing. And you know, when he, when he went into Auschwitz, all his possessions were taken away. He was separated from his wife and his sister and the, the other members of the family. And he thought that the way to uh, actually see whether his method worked, because he'd already worked out that meaning was very important, was, was to ask himself the question, how do you find meaning in a concentration camp? Yeah. And for him, the meaning was to remember what he'd written in the book and make you know little notes on scraps of paper, back of cigarette packets, and th things like that. You know, so that his objective was to survive. You know, and, and he actually outlived Adolf Hitler as it happened, but but to survive. And, and then he imagined himself giving lectures about the the psychology of meaning to packed audiences, and it was that that kept him alive during things. So, if, in a sense, it, his his methodology was self validated by saying. You know, what he said was important is important to have meaning and the circumstances in which you find yourself are unimportant. Well, of course, a concentration camp would be the classical example of that. That was his transforming experience. And we'd never have heard of Viktor Frankl, frankly, if he had not been in the concentration camp. And that, that acquired this almost messianic belief that his idea about meaning in life was actually correct. And of course, he had great credibility as a result of a person who'd survived as a result of, of that particular methodology. That was his transforming experience. For Bezos, it was a transforming experience of uh, stopping working on um, Wall Street, uh, which he hated, and he went to work for a quantitative uh, firm of um, really computer scientists run by a professor, former computer science professor called David Shaw, who set out this company called D.E. Shaw & Company as an alternative investment mechanism yeah. and he said it was it was david shaw who set bezos off on this project of the everything store as they turn uh, turned it and what shaw knew that nobody else did was that the, the internet was going to be hugely important for business so that was a rare thing which was 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 done if uh, bezos had not gone and worked for david shaw and worked on this project and then asked if he could take that project not within David Shaw's company, but outside and form Amazon. You know, we would probably never have heard of Jeff Bezos. And similarly, Mrs. Thatcher, I mentioned earlier, you know, she was a hopeless uh, failure as uh, prime minister in the, her first two and a half years. All her colleagues were turning against her. The opinion polls were absolutely dire. There was a new political party, the uh, uh, Social Democratic Party, SDP, which was set up, which, you know, appeared to be taking all support from her. And then the Falklands happened. You know, General Gautieri of, of Argentina decided to invade what he called the Malvinos, uh, these, this island in the middle of the Pacific that almost nobody lived in. Uh, and uh, that galvanized Mrs. Thatcher. And she said, but contrary to all the advisors, that we can recapture the, the force and we must do that because we must prove that aggression doesn't pay. And everyone thought she was completely mad. Uh, the US Navy said that it was technically infeasible to retake the, the islands. Uh, even her friend uh, Ronald Reagan, you know, would, wanted her to negotiate with Galtieri. But she's, you know, in the, in, in the nicest possible way, she kept saying no. Uh, and by a huge chapter of accidents and um, obviously the bravery of the people involved, 
they actually did manage to recapture these islands, which were 13,000 miles away from, from Britain. So, you know, that was a transforming. And after that, there was no stopping Mrs. Thatcher. Whether you agree or disagree with what she was doing, she, she was very bold. She privatized all the established nationalized industries. Like in Britain, you, used to, you couldn't get a telephone installed for months and months and months because it was all run by the government. <laughs> it was called the general post office, you know, and part of the post office was people in charge of telecommunications. It, a totally absurd system. But, but no one in Britain before her said that, you know, we can privatize all these utilities and, and, and actually do it. And she took on the miners and so on and so forth. There was no stopping her because she'd been through this experience and she'd taken a stand on a particular issue and been extraordinarily lucky with it, as well as extraordinarily brave and so on. So I would say to people, if you want to be unreasonably successful, have you had an unreasonable, uh, have you had a transforming experience? And people may say yes or no, but most people say no. And, and then I say, well, actually, <clears throat> these people didn't design their own transforming experience. It just happened. But unless you have one of these things, you are probably not going to be unreasonably successful. So you better think about putting yourself in the slipstream of events where conceivably a transforming experience can happen. And there are other things like self-belief, which is absolutely critical, having very high expectations, absolutely critical, developing your intuition, also very important. And what Jobs did very well, which I call reality distortion, is pretending that something can be done when everyone else thinks it can't be done. And in a way, it's just saying that reality can be changed, but he called it reality distortion. Uh, but if you can convince yourself and convince a small group of followers that actually it can be done, and one of the people in the book is Vladimir Lenin, who persuaded his revolutionary supporters that because the um, czar of Russia, the, the, the hereditary ruler of Russia, um, could rule this huge, vast country, through a network of about 2,000 people who were basically the officials of the, of the regime, if he had 2,000 revolutionaries who believed that revolution was possible, then they could do that. And in the circumstances of um, Russia in 1917, after being defeated in the First World War, those people were able to seize power. They they uh, took made a coup d'etat. They removed the new democratically elected people because they actually sent them into the um, into the uh, chamber of the, the parliament which was set up and shot the people who would not agree to go along with what Lenin was trying to do. But whether the intentions are good or bad, you need to have a, a transforming experience and you need to do things differently. I think if, you, if I had to sum up the most important thing, and you have to really believe that what you can do can be done. Uh, yeah. But anyway... Of these nine things are illustrated in the book with lots of um, very nice little stories to, to go. But I'm convinced that I have, if you like, got to the bottom of the 80-20 of success. I don't use the word 80 all in the book, but that's what I intended to do. And I just want a lot of people to be a lot more successful because that's what generates growth, creativity, and the texture of life, which makes it exciting and interesting. Yeah. So there, I think we're going to have to stop, Sean. But thank you very much indeed. This has been a great interview. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and for people that want to check it out, we'll we'll have all the links to the to the book, to to the previous books that you've written, and if if you know, given how powerful and how insightful some of the previous books that you've written, I think I think this is going to be uh, definitely worth reading. I kind of look at it as almost like Walter Isaacson and because of the stories that you've laid out, but you've done an 80-20, uh, you know, I, I know you don't use the word 80-20, but you've kind of really done an 80-20 of, of these key figures uh, and, and the biographies that you've chosen. So it's a very powerful book and highly recommend it. So uh, Richard, thanks so much for coming on the show. And, um, and and really thank you guys for tuning in. Sure. Yeah, thanks very much indeed, everyone, for listening as well. And uh, be unreasonably successful. Work out how to do it. It's very important in your life. Thank you very much, Sean.